By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Raging Bull series. We have reached the top eight, so now it's going to get serious. We're going to see two really strong decks. We have Frank, who's playing a Robots Brew, fully powered, and he's taking on a Dead Guy Ill deck that's piloted by Rob, also fully powered. So these are two really good decks. Of course, that's the reason why they've reached the top eight here. I mean, remember, we started this tournament with 76 players now only eight remain two of them are going to battle it out today to see who's going to make it into the semi-finals now before we start with that of course i'm first going to do the deck text now i know that some people prefer to first go to the games check out the deck text later now the easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps including a timestamp that reads mtg games so click on there It'll take you straight to the games. Um, and in that same description below, by the way, you can find a link to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash timmytalks. And please take a moment to look at that page and find out uh, how you can become a patron of the show. That would just be fantastic. It already starts with $1. So if you have a moment, please take a look at patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Okay, now that all the information is out of the way, we are going to start with the deck deck section of this video. I'm going to start with the deck of Frank and his Robots Brew. Here we go. And here we see the robots deck of Frank. So what I like about robots decks is that there are so many different paths you can take with them. You know, the core of each deck is usually that you play with four Suchis, with three or with four uh, Trikes, Triskelions, in this case, Frank is playing with three, and that you're playing with copy artifacts. That's basically the base that all these decks have in common. But then of course you can make choices are you going to add black? Are you going to add white? Are you going to add red? Maybe even green for Titania's song, you know, for some tricks later in the game. So that's kind of where the diversity kicks in here. In this deck, you see that Frank went a little bit with black. You know, we see the Abyss, which of course works really well with this robots decks because you don't have to sack any creatures and your opponent does. So he's playing one of those. Anime Dead, a card that works really well with the Triskelion, so he's only playing with one. Actually, his black contribution is quite modest. He's, of course, got the Mind Twist and the Demonic Tutor. Then when we look at the blue contribution, we see, of course, the Copy Artifacts. We also see a Time Walk, the Ancestral Recall, the Time Twister, you know, the Power Cards, and then we also see Brain Geyser, Mana Drain, and then we also have the Transmute Artifact, which I think is quite interesting because not a lot of decks are playing this anymore. I feel like you used to see them way more in these Artifact Brews, right? These Toolbox decks. Transmute Artifact, too blue to cast for a sorcery. I love the art of this one. I actually have an artist proof. I like it so much. And it reads, sacrifice an artifact. If you do, search your library for an artifact card. If that card's mana value is less than or equal to the sacked artifact's mana value, put it onto the battlefield. If it's greater, you may pay X, where X is the difference. If you do, put it onto the battlefield. If you don't, put it in the graveyard and shuffle. So actually, you could go for, I'm not going to pay for it. I want to have it in my graveyard and then get it with an animate debt. That's kind of a line you can take as well. Not many players do, but it's a line you can take. What I find interesting is that a transmute artifact, in my experience, is really good in these type of decks because you're playing with a lot of Moxen that you can sack to transmute later in the game. Uh, he's also playing with a Winter Orb, for example. There could be scenarios where he wants to get rid of his own Winter Orb. Um, then it can work, and of course it works quite well with the Trike and the Tetravus, because once you've taken the counters off those creatures, they're not that good anymore, right? They're just a 1-1, one -one, a 1-1 one -one flyer, or a 1-1 one -one on the ground. They're quite useless. So with the Transmute Artifact, you're doing two things, and you're getting a big artifact in return, because you can choose an artifact of up to six uh, colorless mana to put on the battlefield, plus the creature goes into the graveyard, which makes it an excellent target for your anime dead. So I can see the Transmute Artifact work here, there's only one, though, in the deck, so it's not really a strategy of Frank, but still, I'm happy to see it, and hopefully we can see it in action as well in this game. Then we also have the white contribution, and that's quite interesting, right? Because it's so modest. We see four Disenchant, we see a Balance, and we see a uh, an Armageddon, which is pretty cool. Just a one-off Armageddon. I guess if you cast it at the right time, you know, you can it can help you win the game. It can kind of lock your opponent up, so... I like that. There's actually quite a lot of one-offs in the deck of Frank, making it probably pretty hard to play against, right? Because you just never know what you're going to get. Uh, the Swords to Plowshares, for example, are not in the main 60. They're in the sideboard together with Wrath of God. So that's quite interesting. Also, we see an extra Abyss in the sideboard. So 
Yeah, it, it, it looks like an interesting combination of cards, you know. It, for example, he could have gone for an extra abyss, take out an icy manipulator, but he's chosen to go with three icy manipulators, which is pretty heavy on those icy. So that's another thing that kind of intrigues me. I do like uh, the decision that he's made to go for the four disenchants main, because if you only play with black and blue, it's really difficult to deal with enchantments and artifacts, especially once they're on the battlefield, right? And the disenchant solves that. So just those four cards, they can solve a lot of problems for you that you can have when you're playing this specific color combination. So I understand the inclusion here of the full playset of Disenchants. I do think that after uh, sideboarding, he's probably gonna board in a lot of those creature removal cards because he is playing against a pretty creature heavy deck. Also a deck with a lot of Arabian Nights so that sitting in a bottle could be really useful. Talking about uh, the deck of his opponent, let's take a look at the list of Rob. And here we see the deck of Rob. So like I said in the introduction, there are a lot of players today that play kind of with a dead guy Ailish deck with blue power, right? So we see a lot of Jews and Jins today and I love it. You know, I think it's really cool. There was a, a time where I hardly saw any Jews Ams at tournaments and now they're just a lot. Three decks in the top eight alone that are playing with, I believe, a full playset of Jews and Jins. So that's pretty cool. And you know, what makes black and white so strong? It's just the fact that you need so little mana to destroy so much, right? Sinkhole for two, Disenchant for two, Swords for, for one. You've got your Divine Offering that's gonna give you life. And then of course you have access to those really strong creatures. And in this case, uh, Rob is also kind of going for that Surrender Befreed. So he's going for Juzam Jin and Surrender Befreed. Now, of course, the big risk with this strategy is the city in a bottle. So, I mean, if you run into a deck that maybe plays a city main or has multiple of those in the sideboard, it can get really difficult. Another card, but it's a little bit easier to deal with, is of course the Maze of If. Maze of If no longer being restricted is a really good card against the Surrendip and the Juzam because, you know, they stop you from dealing damage and you are taking damage. Because remember, these creatures have an upkeep cost of one life, right? You've got to pay one life every upkeep or actually it just deals the damage to you. So that's, that's a little difference, I guess. But you know what I mean. But of course, the solution here is in the deck in the form of four sinkholes, right? Um, and then when we're looking at the rest of the deck, it's just really strong. It's just a lot of good cards put together and I'm not surprised that this reaches the top eight. Now also when we look at the sideboard, we see a lot of like good weapons that he can actually use in this matchup. I think Energy Flux is probably the most impressive one here in the sideboard. One blue and two for this enchantment from Antiquities that says during your upkeep, the player has to pay two per artifact or else the artifact is destroyed. So this is great against those Moxon heavy decks that he's playing against. Frank plays with all the Moxon and of course Frank's deck is super artifact heavy because it's a robots deck. So I mean, this Energy Flux can do a lot of work. Now do remember, of course, that's one of the reasons probably why Frank is playing a full play set of Disenchant. So it's could be interesting to see after sideboarding, you know, how good is the city in the bottle and the abyss going to be on the side of Frank and how good are the energy fluxes going to be on the side of Rob. It's also, you know, a little bit of luck that way, right? That you that you can find that hate card at the right time and of course for your opponent not to have a direct answer for it. So, I mean, I have to say the choice of Frank to go with Disenchant's four main is looking really good against uh, these type of decks. Anyway, uh, this is the deck of Rob. We've already looked at the deck of Frank. That means we're ready. Let's go to the first top eight match of the Raging Bull series. Game number one, here we go. So on the left, we have Frank playing with his robots deck. It's white, blue, and black. He's taking on Rob. He's on the play here, starting with the Library of Alexandria. And he's playing mainly black and white, also some blue in there. A dead guy ill deck with Juzam Jins, Surrender Perfreets, and of course, a lot of Disenchants and Swords of Plowshares. And let's see what Frank can do on his first turn, starting with a Scrubland Mox Jet into a Demonic Tutor. So I guess he's gonna look for some uh, land removal to take care of that uh, Library of Alexandria. Although he is looking at his hand, maybe he's got better options. The normal thing to do, which isn't always the best thing to do, but the normal, your instinct would say, let's find something to get rid of that uh, Library of Alexandria. For example, a strip mine. But I mean, Frank's looking at his hand, maybe he's got better options, you know. Who knows? This could be interesting. We can see the cards there, skipping the Chaos Orb, moving along. And I think he's gonna go for the strip mine. I mean, you kind of have to, right? Let me know in the comments below what you would do in this scenario. I mean, 
an active library against you is just so good. And remember, uh, Rob was on the play, so he hasn't used it yet. He's got six in hand, so next turn he can use it. Of course, Frank already had his land drop, so it's not like he can destroy it straight away. So, I mean, Rob is going to get a card out of it. But, yeah, you can still contain it now with that strip mine. And I don't believe he's playing with any other land removal in the deck. Ooh, he changed his... Uh, Changed his choice there. Now I'm not sure what he took. What did he take? That went like really fast. No, no, no. I changed his back end. What card was that? I can't see. What? Now I still can't see. He's going too fast. I have no idea. At first I saw a strip mine. He changed his mind twice. Can't really see it. There's a Suchi in hand there, but I'm sure that's not the card he picked. Perhaps he went for the time walk there. See a time walk. I guess that's his choice. Maybe he wants to uh, win it based on tempo. But does he have a blue source though? Anyway, let's first see what uh, Rob can do. Drawing the extra card, playing a City of Brass in a mock jet. Probably wants to keep six in hand. And now Frank's gonna untap. What is he gonna do? Oh wow, there's a Mishra's Workshop playing a Suchi, passing the turn. If he looked up the time walk, I mean, without a blue source, does that make sense? Perhaps he looked up the workshop though, to kind of play out his big creatures. He's got a copy artifact as well. So if he draws into blue, he's in a really good shape. But for now, uh, it's looking great for Rob as well because he has that active Loa playing out a Mishra's factory. And I wouldn't be surprised to see like a swords or a disenchant on this uh, Suchi here. Tapping the city for damage and the jet. There's a disenchant. Now remember, we are playing with Swedish rules. That's why Frank is not taking any mana burn. Because when the Suchi dies, you get four colorless mana. And then of course, if you can't spend it, you know, under the old rules, you would get four damage. But there's no mana burn in this format. So no damage here for Frank. Playing out a Mox Emerald, another Suchi hitting the board. I think the scenario that Frank was hoping for was that he would deploy a lot of threats, he would draw into blue, you know, be able to play out the time walk and the copy artifact, and just put so much pressure on Rob that he's kind of forced to play out his hand. Uh, you know, e even though he's got the Library of Alexandria and he doesn't want to, but he's forced to because there's so much pressure. For now, that plan isn't really working because of the excellent removal that you have when you play with... Uh, with white, you know, this is why white is such an amazing color because you've got the disenchant and the swords. It's all instant speed removal for nothing, right? One white mana, one white mana and one. I mean, it's insanely cheap. I mean, you're, you're tapping four mana at a time and your opponent has answers for two mana at instant speed. You know, it's really hard to, uh, to work against that. Here we see the trike hitting the board, so the 4-4 four, four, with the three plus one plus one counters that you can take off to deal one damage to any target. And now we see Rob using his Loa again. So it already has given him, I believe, three extra cards. So that's like an Ancestral Recall. And here we see the uh, Swords to Plowshare. So that means three damage here to the Dome. Rob dropping to 16. But I mean, that's not really impressive, is it? Okay, he's changing his mind though. So I guess he's going to put two damage on the life total of Rob then. And pings his uh, Triskelion for one. So then I believe Rob should go to 17, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, let's see what else he can do. He's got a time twister in hand that makes no sense to play out, I guess. Yeah, now he's going to go back up to 17. I guess both players are discussing it. He only took one damage from the City of Brass, I think. But So now he's back on 17. Let's see what else he can do. Oh, he's got a Black Lotus there, but he probably doesn't want to accelerate, though. Because he has that Loa. So two, four, seven cards in hand. Take another damage. Now he's going to drop to 16. Play a sinkhole on the uh, workshop. Yeah, that is that is great. I mean, it looks like Rob has everything under control here. This is going to be really, really tough for Frank. I mean, you know, Rob's just finding all those control cards in combination with the Library of Alexandria. This is an absolute killer. He would see the attack for two. And I understand this attack because all that Frank can do at this point is try to be aggressive tried to put some pressure on but it's not really working i mean he's still on 14 oh another removal card there's the swords this is just insane i mean he's finding everything he needs a disenchant two swords and a sinkhole that's ideal for him but then again it's not surprising when you're drawing so many extra cards with your library of alexandria 
Anyway, eight cards in hand now for Rob. Let's see what he can do with those. Looks like he's want to draw. He wants to drop the Black Lotus. Perhaps going for the Sengir play. Going for a Mox Pearl instead. Seven in hand now. Could deploy the Sengir Vampire. He would take a damage from City of Brass, drop to 13, but then he would have a 4-4 Flyer on the board to put some pressure on. There we see the Sengir. 4-4 Flyer, then does Frank have a Swords? If he has it, he's not using it yet. Drawing a card for turn. Still cannot find blue, by the way. That's really been a problem for him, and now we find the Strip Mine. At least, at least the Strip Mine's gone, you know. But I, I believe it's already done its, its work here in this game one. And Frank is really unfortunate for not finding that blue source. Because that could have kind of changed it. Remember, he's got a copy artifact and a time walk in hand. I mean, that's quite powerful. Both of those cards in his deck. There's a swamp being played by Rob. I expect him here to attack for four at least. Putting Frank on 20. There's an icy manipulator. That icy again is pretty good because he can tap down the scrubland in his upkeep. But there's a disenchando on end step. And now Frank taking on his turn. Let's see what he can find. Okay, there's the abyss. This is good news. This is a very good top deck here. Remember, he's only playing with one abyss main. He's got one in the side that I expect him to put in. But this is a big problem for uh, for Rob. I mean, he needs a disenchant, right? He can still attack now for two, by the way, with his uh, factory. Question is, does he want to, though? Okay, now he's going to accelerate Black Lotus on the board. What can he do with it, though? That Abyss is really a problem for him. It's a showstopper. I wonder what he's going to do here. Going through his artifacts, trying to figure out what mana does he have, what doesn't he have. I believe there's another Swords in hand. I wonder if he's gonna attack. He is gonna attack, it seems, for two. That means Frank's gonna drop to 18, but it also means that he's opening up and saying to Frank, you know what, you animate and you attack me. And of course he's doing that because he's got that Swords in Hand problem. There's a Tundra. Is he gonna animate and attack? Rope being on 13, is he gonna take the risk? He's thinking about it. Now remember, he also has a copy artifact, so maybe he wants to animate and then try to copy it. So animating it. There's the quick response though. And I think one of the things, again, it's easy for me to look at it now because I can see the hands, etc., etc. And you know, I'm not in that top eight match with the tension. But one of the things you usually want to do with your swords, because it's instant, is wait as long as possible. Because maybe Frank would have said, animate it, then I'm going to copy it. Then in response of the copy, you play out your swords over the factory, and then all of a sudden Frank doesn't have a target anymore and has to pick like one of his Moxen, for example. He's doing that now anyway. Probably going to go for the Mox Sapphire, exactly, because he wants to have a blue source. And then going to go for the Time Walk. Yeah, there's a Time Walk. Time Walk, unfortunately, just not as good now, but I do understand this play. going to try to find something I mean if he can find like an ancestral recall brain geyser you know he can draw in some more cards maybe a time twister there are a lot of cards in there that can give him new perspective for now he only has two cards in hand and he doesn't have six mana right so even if that one card is Driskelion which is really good in his deck he can't even play it But I guess Frank has some options because he is taking his time though. What could he have? Passing the turn. Ooh, there's a surrender. But again, you don't want to play it out against the Abyss. He needs to find a disenchant. In the meanwhile, he can just attack for two right with the factory. That's not uh, too bad for him. Gonna put Frank here on, uh, on 19 it seems. And there's the pass turn. Tapping, there's a soul ring, probably from the top of the deck. So not much changing here. OK, 
Okay, there's a Triskelion. So there is something changing because now he's got enough mana to cast that trike because he found that Soul Ring. Divine Offering though. Ooh, this is so good. Now, the nice thing here for Frank, and you see it happening here, is that, okay, Divine Offering, you would guess that Rob would get six life, but in response, Frank can kill his own trike and deal two damage to Rob. So that's why trike is such a good card, you know? You always take some damage as an opponent and your Divine Offering doesn't work. But I mean, in a way it does because it has destroyed the trike and that was the goal anyway. And there's a Disenchant, by the way. This is huge Disenchant here. Taking care of the Abyss. This could be the game changer. Frank being on 17, by the way, after taking uh, another hit here. And I believe he should be, by the way, he should be lower on life because he's only taking one damage. Maybe I'm making a mistake here. Anyway, there's the Surrender Free 3 4 Flyer. That is really good for Rob here. And now. Um, Frank is under pressure, has to find an answer. His life total is still pretty high up, but it looks like he's going to take five damage a turn. That would put him on a four turn clock. That's bad news for Frank. Only two more cards for uh, Rob and also two cards for Frank, by the way. And uh, Rob being on 11, Frank being on 17. Tapping four, are we going to see another Suchi transmute artifact? Okay, so he's going to sack probably the soaring, so he's got two men in the mana pool. What is he going to do? Could go for City in a Bottle. You know? Oh, he's going to go for that Icy Manipulator. He's got two floating, can pay two, then he still has a mana open to tap the Surrender. That could be an option. Lots and lots of options here, but not really one, like, perfect one, right? Because, yes, it's good, you know, an Icy, but it only solves one problem, which is a Surrender per Freak, but you still have that factory that can continue attacking you. So it's not great, but it's something. And, and usually when you're tutoring, you're looking for a card that maybe can get you two steps ahead. And that's not what's happening here in this case. I think, by the way, that tapping the two Moxie was correct, right? Oh, of course, because you also get a mana from the Soaring. Yeah, so the way Transmute Artifact works is when you sack your Artifact, you can look for an Artifact that has the same casting cost or lower. If it has a higher casting cost, you've got to pay for that. So Soaring has a casting cost of one. So, you know, Icy Manipulator having a casting cost of four, it means you've got to pay three extra mana. He's still at two mana floating from the Soaring itself, and then he taps the Emerald. So, I mean, it checks out. Here we see the tap, by the way, of the Surrender. There's an attack for two. And now he's going to drop here. Oh, he was, okay, he's going to drop to 15 now. Was on 17, drops to 15. Another Surrender hitting the board. Oh, man, this is a lot of pressure for Frank. Does he have a balance in his deck? I think he probably does. So a balance could be a way out still. Now, Rob, of course, is taking two damage a turn from his own Surrenders, dropping to eight. So he's quite low as well. But, I mean, he can now deal five points of damage because I'm expecting Frank here to tap down exactly one of the Surrenders. And uh, Rob, there Rob goes. Five points of damage. We see Frank dropping to ten. There's the pass. Two cards in hand for Frank. What can he do? He's on 10. Rope's on 8. Gonna drop to 6 next turn. There's the pass. Gonna go to 6 because of the Surrenders. Draw for turn. Ooh, there's a factory. That's pretty good because then he can pump his factory an additional point. So it deals 6 points of damage this turn. There's the tap, there's the attack, there's the pump. So taking six, dropping to four. Oh my, Frank only has one last turn. I mean, it's close to impossible, right? Another icy. Okay, I mean, that's good, but it's not going to save him, though. I think it's the end of the road here. I mean, he can tap down to two surrenders and still take four. There's the pass, though. Dropping to four. Both players on four. What does Frank have in hand? Could it be some kind of artifact removal? And, oh, there's a sinkhole. So he can still use the mana, of course, to tap something down. There's the animate. 
Tapping down, taking four. That's it. This is game number one. Oh, there was a Diamond Valley in hand. If only he would have had something to sack. But uh, wow, that was quite an interesting game one year. I think it already started to be super uh, interesting with that decision by Frank not to go for the strip mine, uh, you know, but I guess instead to go for the workshop. So that was a really interesting decision. And I kind of could see what he had in mind, but he couldn't find any blue to kind of back it up with the copy artifact time walk. Uh, a play after that and of course he had the bad luck that Rob found all his removal so all in all a very interesting game one and both players are now going to dive into their sideboards and we are going to catch back up with them in game uh, number two game uh, number two here we go and I believe that uh, Rob has taken a mulligan perhaps even double mulligan now we're just have to see how many cards he's going to put on the bottom of his library check out the hand enough lands is that a black lotus that artifact there or a mox pearl hard to see and of course, it's Frank on the player. He's keeping his hand, keeping his first seven. Yep, double mulligan here, going down to five. Changing his mind though. Yep, going down to five. I was like, is he gonna take another mull? That would mean uh, he would have to put three cards away. You really don't wanna do that. A double mull is already quite hard. There's a uh, scrub land and a pass. Let's see what uh, Rob can do here. Turn one, also a scrub land and a pass. There we see an underground sea for Frank, which is good. Blue mana is good for his deck. Also has a Tundra there. Thinking about playing out the Mistress Factory. Going for the Tundra. Passing the turn. Another Scrubland there. And there's an underground sea. Mox Pearl tapping three. Surrender Pafrit hitting the board. Three for Flyer. Are we going to see a Quick Swords? There's a Swords taking care of business. It does mean three life for uh, Rob, so he's gonna go up to 23. And now we see Frank taking on his turn. Let's see what he can do in uh, turn number three. Of course, his creatures are a little bit more costly with the Suchi and the Triskelions. It also looks like he's got a Sarah Angel in the deck now. No, or is that a Swords? It's just hard to see. Probably isn't a Sarah Angel, by the way, because it wasn't on his list, so <laughs> that would be kind of weird. It would be a Sarah Angel hitting the table. Anyway, there's another Surrender Pafrit here, and I believe that's a Swords there that Frank has in hand, so he could play that Swords. Exactly. So there's another Swords, another three more life points for Rob, so he's going to go up to 26. And let's see what Frank can do. He can, of course animate his own factory to try to deal some damage but it's risky though i mean you could run into a swords lose a land there in the process he's got four mana now are we going to see a suchi for example i don't believe it's in his hand yeah it's going to animate attack for two so he's going to take the risk of running into a swords here there's the attack there's the swords so he could pump it to take an extra life not doing it though going to go up to 22. Tapping the Tundra. And there's a disenchant. Passing the turn here. Another Scrubland. So four mana and two Serenity Freaks already in the bin. And it looks like Rob is kind of out of steam here. Remember, he did take a double mulligan. Ooh, that Ancestral Recall. Is that an Ancestral Recall? That is really good. That Frank can refill his hand. And having an Ancestral Recall already against an opponent who started with two cards less than you, that's huge. There's the Ancestral Recall. So he's going to draw three cards. Finding a copy. A Mox Pearl. And then another blue card. Perhaps a Mana Drain. Hard to see. Let's see what he's gonna do. Of course, he can play out the Mox Pearl if he wants. It goes for Black Lotus. Mox Pearl. What are we gonna see here? Animating. Ooh, he's gonna try to copy it. Are we gonna see a Disenchant or a Swords? No, we're not. And now the trick works. So this is always risky, right? Because if, for example, Rob would have had a Disenchant to take care of the factory, that would have been a problem. But I think in this case, Frank was right because he's pretty uh, safe with Rob only on one card in hand. So I think that's an acceptable risk. Oh, look at this though. 
coming from the sideboard to cause absolute mayhem is the energy flux. So energy flux means that Frank now has to pay two mana per artifact. Now remember the factories are, are lands, so you don't have to pay for those, but during your upkeep you do have to pay for the Black Lotus and for the Mox Pearl, so a total of four mana. And yeah, this is this is just not great here. It's not the end, it's not the end, but it's just not great. So he's gonna use the mana from the Black Lotus to pay for the Mox Pearl. And what else is he gonna do here? I think then he's gonna draw for turn, exactly. Gonna go to three in hand. Yeah, that Mox Jet is not gonna help him much. I mean, I would just animate attack for four, right? That's, that's all you can really do, which is not too bad. I mean, you hit your opponent for four, pass the turn. Ooh, there's a Swords though. There's a Mana Drain taking care of that Swords to Plowshares. That's really good here for Frank. Four points of damage. Rob, of course, being still pretty high up after gaining all those life from the Swords to Plowshares on his Surrendips. Currently on 19, it seems, right? Yeah, 19. And now Frank has to decide, do I want to keep my Mox alive or not? So the Mox can pay one for itself, but he still have to tap a land down. It looks like that's what he's doing. So he's gonna pay for his Mox. I mean, he's probably just hoping to run into a Disenchant and then uh, take care of the Energy Flux. I'm expecting him here to uh, animate his factories. Looks like he's only gonna animate one though. And then he can swing in for two, pump it with the other, swing in for three, but of course he could do an extra point of damage animating both, but maybe he doesn't want to take the risk. He is animating both, attacking for four. For a moment there it looked like, you know, Rob and another removal, you know, grabbing to that one card in hand. And I think if you're Rob, you kind of have to hope for a blue power card, right? Or of course a mind twist, I mean, but that's... It's not great in this, this scenario, actually, because yes, it's nice you take out the two cards of Frank, but what you really want to do is change things there on the battlefield. So a Brain Geyser or Ancestral Recall would, would have been much better here for uh, Rob to kind of dig, get some new cards. There's again the attack for four. 11, that means he's on a three turn clock now. So three more turns. Okay, there's a sinkhole. That is really great. Because now he went from three turns to six turns, actually. So he doubled his clock there. Ooh, okay. Now the clock's going, going forward again, taking three points of damage. Dropping to eight, I believe. That means he's on a four-turn clock, now a two-turn clock again with the double factory. So Rope's still looking for answers. And I mean, Frank just finding those factories, and factories are just so good. Animating again, swinging for four. Ooh, Rob dropping to four, he's got one last turn. Needs to find at least a sinkhole disenchant. Okay, this is good too, it can block. This works. The problem, of course, it is gonna kill him too, because it deals one damage a turn, but hey, it's something. I wonder what he's gonna do. Is he gonna let the Mox die? I mean, it kind of would make sense. Yeah, just gonna let it die. I wonder if he's gonna attack with both factories, because then at least you still deal two points of damage here to Rob. So he's gonna drop to two, then he's gonna drop to one from his own uh, Juzam Jin. He's gonna pass the turn here. He's on three. Oh, 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 there's a Mox Sapphire being drawn, therefore Rob that's not going to help him much. Or perhaps it was already the card in hand, we don't know. There's the attack for five, Frank taking the damage gladly. There's a Time Walk, ooh, he's going to go to two. So he, he pulled the Time Walk from the top of the deck. And he already had the Sapphire. There's a city. Oh, he's going to deal damage to himself. He's like, whatever. <laughs> Not finding what he needed, but he came. 
very close though there at the end and I I mean Frank was just really really lucky finding all those factories right and don't and remember Rob started this game with a double mulligan right going from seven to five and Frank finding the ancestral recall these things happen and I'm happy with it because it means it's one one and we are gonna go to game number three Game number three, here we go, the big decider, the winner here will go to the semifinals. Look at this, a uh, mulligan here by Frank, so he's going to start with six, he's on the draw after of course winning game number two, so let's see what uh, Rob can do, he's kept his first seven, didn't take a mulligan, starting with a Mistress Factory and a pass. Ooh, finding a library of Alexandria from the top. The thing is of course he is now on seven, so if he's going to play it out he can't draw a card straight away, still I think it's the right thing to do, right? Because the next turn you draw into card seven and draw an extra one straight away, so get your value. Of course, Rob is playing with land removal, playing with four sinkholes, but I mean, sinkhole is double black, so he probably cannot use it next turn. That means that at least Frank gets one activation out of it. Ooh, look at that ancestral recall being drawn by uh, Rob. So these players are really finding the good cards. We're going to see a lot of card draw happening this turn. Six in hand there, it seems. For Rob, that makes sense. Passing the turn. And then in the upkeep, no, he's not going to play Ancestral Recall there in the upkeep. That's kind of what I expected. Here we see the library activation by Frank. In response, we see the Ancestral Recall activation. So he's going to go from five cards up to eight. There's a Mox Jet there for Frank. Tundra could play the jet as well. Then again, he wants to keep enough cards in hand, of course, to keep that low activation. I believe with the Mox Jet, he now has got six in hand, probably gonna pass. Now let's see what Rob can do. There's the Scrubland. Ooh, playing out Energy Flux, that is pretty good. Are we gonna see an instant disenchant? If Frank does though, it means he cannot activate his Loa, because he would go down to five cards in hand. Yeah, reading the Energy Flux, probably knowing already what it does, but hoping to read something different. There's the Disenchant. Yeah, and this is really good for Rob, because it was really a win-win situation. If he plays a Disenchant, fine, you're not going to draw your extra card, and you're probably going to wait a whole turn, do nothing, right? Because you want to get that Loa back in action again. I mean, another thing that's maybe tempting here for Frank is to play out that Winter Orb. It looks like he's not doing it though. I think I would just keep the cards in hand, then again, it's easy for me to say, but I mean, you've got six, you really want to get that Library of Alexandria back into action. Looks like he's going to do something different though. Does he have maybe a Demonic Tutor in hand? Don't think so. Ooh, yeah, he is going for that Winter Orb play. Yeah, yeah, it's of course very tempting. Kind of going off his uh, Library of Alexandria plan here with playing out the uh, Mox Ruby and also the uh, Black Lotus. Oh, and then he's gonna go for the Icy Manipulator. Okay, I get this. Remember, you can deactivate uh, Winter Orb by tapping it down with your Icy, which is really good. Only one card left in the hand, passing the turn. And he's gonna tap down the land. He's like, I got you now. And this is very difficult for Rob. At least finding a land, it seems, from the top so he can play something out, that's good. Passing the turn here. And yeah, of course, Frank had to choose what he's going to untap. Exactly, so he could only untap one land. That's what Winter Orb does. I think this is correct. I think he only had two lands tapped, but I, I could be mistaken. We can rewind the tape and we can check. And now Frank has to choose. What is he going to do? Yeah, perhaps he tapped out completely. That could be the case as well. Anyway, um, having one dual untapped still, the Tundra, and of course having his Moxon. Passing the turn here. Wonder if you're Frank. I mean, I would be tempted to go for exactly go for City of Brass, deal a damage. Oh, in response, disenchant. He is dropping to 19. 
And this happens in his upkeep. There is the Tundra here, another one. Beautiful black bordered one, by the way, beautiful decks. And Rob passing the turn, but next turn is gonna be very precarious for Frank. There will be a lot of creatures hitting the board. That hand is chock full. Let's see what uh, Frank can do before that happens. Tapping three, tapping four. Are we gonna see a Suchi, for example? There's an Armageddon. Oh, I'm loving this. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. This is so good. Like It's like Frank is standing on a ledge, right? He's about to fall down, but then he finds this one play that keeps him around. I love it. And when you're Rob, you're like, oh, really? Really? I could finally untap and play out my big boys, and you're doing this to me? And remember, Frank, of course, still has that icy to tap down the land of Rob here. I mean, we could be in for a long game. At least I think Rob's finding a land here again, so there is a swamp. That's something. And I think if you're Frank, you just want to keep the planes tapped down. And this is ideal for him, that factory. That is really good. Oh, he's choosing to play out the Suchi. I think, in all honesty, I think I would have waited with the Suchi. I would have just tapped down the planes. But maybe it's too defensive, I don't know. There we see uh, a Swords to Plowshares. Going to go back up to 20 or going to go up to 24 because he was still on 20. He can animate the factory, attack for two here and keep mana open to tap down the, uh, the planes. There he goes. I mean, things are looking good for Frank. The problem for Frank is he only has two cards in hand, but I mean, ooh, more lands. There's a time walk. Okay, this is really good here because now he can play out one of his Surrender Befreaks and put some pressure on the board. Yep, there's a Surrender Befreak. No, a Mind Twist, even worse. Oh, that balance. Oh, and Frank is pointing it out. That balance was so good, but Frank, of course, doesn't have white mana. So it was a really good Mind Twist by Rob here, taking care of the balance. Oh man, that is very unfortunate for Frank. Playing out another Icy. This is again a little risk. I mean, you gotta play out stuff as well, I get that, but this is risky. There's a Soul Ring. Now we can play out another Surrender. Doesn't have to two black mana to play out a Juzam, or else that would have been an option. Can also go for the Time Twister, but why would you want to give your opponent seven new cards? I think the Surrender Befreed is the best play to make, although of course I cannot identify all the cards in hand here. Perhaps there's no Surrender left anymore. I see a Juzam Jin, I see a Time Twister, and then three cards in between. Two blue ones, it's blue ones it seems, and one black one. And no cards in hand for Frank anymore. But of course Frank does have that double Icy. Oh, what can he do? Okay, there is another Surrendip, exactly. Deploying that Surrendip, that is really good here. Frank drawing his card for turn. Playing out another Mox, not super helpful. And then he's got to choose what he's going to tap down next turn. Ooh, tapping it out main to have an extra attack in. Gonna attack them for two, I guess. Gonna put Rob here on 15. Passing the turn, Rob taking a damage from his own Surrendip. Let's see, I'm expecting, well, there's still not that second black. Oh, there's another Surrendip in hand. A lot of Surrendips here for Rob, but of course Surrendips are also risky because Frank has that double Icy Manipulator. Tapping down the Surrendip before combat, and there's a second Surrendip hitting the board. But this is not necessarily bad news, right, for Frank, because he can just, you know, tap those down and... Rob will slowly go down. I think what's important for, for Frank here is that Rob doesn't find the second swamp to deploy his Juzan. Ooh, there's a Trike. Doesn't have enough mana though to cast it. Remember, Trike is six to cast. We see six mana on the side of Frank. Ooh, it looks like he's gonna tap down and then animate the factory, swing in for two. Gonna put Rob on 12, then he's gonna drop to 10 next turn. Ooh, this is looking bad here for Rob. 
Can he find another swamp? Because then he can... Ooh, an energy flux. That is really good. This energy flux can wreck the game plan here of Frank. Oh, ho, ho, ho. This is... This is super painful for Frank. He only has two lands. Remember, all the other mana are generated by the mana rocks, the Moxen, and they now have an upkeep cost of two. He's gonna lose so many artifacts next turn. This is disastrous for Frank. I think this, this could be an energy flux win here for uh, Rob. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Rob deciding not to attack, by the way. Oh man, this, this, is, this is horrible for Frank. This is horrible for Frank. Now he's in his upkeep. Remember, he's got to pay two mana for every artifact or they are destroyed. He only has two lands. This is a really difficult puzzle. One of the things he could do here is use his Moxen, you know, um, to pay for the ICs, basically, and lose, lose the Moxen as well. And then he still needs an extra land tapped. Yes, he's going to pay two to keep that untapped IC around. He's used to Ruby, and it's all gone. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that is just, that is, this energy flux is so, so, so decisive here in game three. There's the attack for two. I think this is a good strategy, by the way, by Frank, because look at his life total. Frank is still on 24. But I mean, this energy flux has wrecked him completely. And there we see uh, Rob saying, you know what? Bye bye, Mox Pearl. Drawing into another land. It's a scrub land, meaning he can play out his Juzam. Oh, that would be really good for him, playing out the Juzam. Although it's risky, though, because then he takes three damage a turn. This is really risky. What an interesting game number three. Remember, Rob is on six. He's got three more turns to go, which is not enough to kill Frank because Frank is on 24. He needs four turns to kill Frank. So he's got to find a way to gain some life. There's an attack. Doesn't even want to attack with both because then he might take damage from uh, the Mishra's factory. Wow. It's, it's not over. And look at that. Rob playing out his Juzam. Now I'm a little bit surprised that he doesn't that he didn't attack with the other Surrendip. Because you have your Juzam as a blocker, right? Anyway, he's gonna pay for the IC, hoping to find a land at the top. He's gonna go here through the graveyard. What is in his hand? Even if it's a Mox, it would be good. Probably trying to find out how many swords Rob still has. Only one sword in the graveyard of Rob, so that means three swords still in the in the deck. And swords, of course, could be decisive because then Rob can swords, for example, his own Juzam and gain five life. That would make a huge difference. And look at this, Rob dropping to three. This is a thriller of a match. There's a sword though from the top. This makes all the difference. There's a full swing attack. Oh man. Changing his mind, though, it seems. Is he changing his mind here? It looked like it was an attack for 11. That would put Frank on 10. No, it's an attack for 8 instead. That means that Frank goes back up to 13. Changing his mind again. So let's see. Frank is on 21. Oh man, what a thriller of a game three. I'm loving this, I'm loving this, I'm loving this. Rob is on three. He knows he's gonna die next turn, but remember, Rob has a sword, so he's not gonna die next turn. Attacking for eight. Frank on 13. Oh, Frank has an enemy dead in his hand. That's why he went through the graveyard. He's got an enemy dead. Can he do something with that? Oh man, this 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 match is bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. So Rob has this Swords, which he probably wants to play in his own Juzam before he takes an extra point of damage, right? Then he would gain five life, and he would go back up to eight, but then he would lose two from his two of Freets, he would go to six.
Oh man. There's so much there's there there's so much calculating going on. Both players really deep in the tank probably at this point. The winner of this game, the winner of these couple of next turns will go to the semifinals. I mean, the only card I know of the hand of Rob is that one sword to plowshares, and I know that Frank has that one enemy dead. I don't think there's really a good target for either player in the graveyards. Like there's no trike, for example. Yeah, there's the pass turn by Rob. Okay, so he's gonna pay for the icy. Gonna find the land. This is really good. This is great. Gonna pass the turn. Now he's gotta play the swords, right? So he's gonna play the swords. On the Juzam, probably, question mark. Ooh, or not. Serenib would mean you go to six, then go to four. Juzam gives you two extra lives, but of course it also has two more power, so it hits harder. Exactly, so he's gonna sack it. Not quite sure why he puts it on top of the energy flux though, but okay. He's going to go up to 8 and take 2 damage, so he's going to drop to 6, so that's correct. He's on 6. But now remember, Frank can tap down the Surrender, take a hit of 3, go to 10. I mean, it's still looking okay-ish here, actually, for Frank. So he's going to tap down. There's the attack, and then there's the tap. So Frank's on 10. Ooh, this is really good, this strip mine. Oh, and another Juzam. That changes the scenario completely. And now Frank went from a winner to a loser again. Wow. That was a crazy turn for Rob. And now this is a tough decision to make here for Frank. Is he going to let the IC go? Because then, you know, he can play out the anime. But I don't think there are any targets in the graveyards. That is a problem. What if Frank would have had a trike in the bin? Oh, and he's going to win it here. Crazy, 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 crazy. What a game number three. Frank, Rob, thank you so much. I love this magic. And this was exactly the fireworks that I hoped for in the quarterfinals of the Raging Bull series. Thank you guys so much and also thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. I hope you've enjoyed this ma uh, match as much as I did. Now, uh, before you go, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Oh man, I'm just, uh, whew, gotta take a moment. Anyway, um, thank you for doing that. If you're already a subscriber, also thank you so much. With that, you're really helping the channel move forward. Talking about that, please take a moment to like, share and comment. All these things help and all these things are completely free. And before you go, take a moment, take a look at my Patreon page. Consider becoming a patron because that really, really helps Frank here and Rob. Rob, actually, both these players are also patrons of the channel. Thank you guys so much for doing that. So please consider becoming a supporter of Timmy Talks as well. It already starts with $1 a month and you can find the Patreon page on patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And one of the cool perks is that your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video, including this one. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
Bakaji.